I have a 19th century girlfriend. Her name is Annie Sawyer Downs, and she's roughly 140 years older than me. But we both grew up in Massachusetts. We both love the Maine coast. We both have weird professional connections to Henry David Thoreau. We're both botanists who like to verb the noun botanist. We like to say we're going botanizing. <laughs> I fell in love with Annie when I read her 1892 magazine article, How I Botanize. The things I provide myself with when I go botanizing are a pocket knife, a pair of scissors in a case, a little ball of soft string and a tin box, which is carried by a strap over my shoulder. I wear a plain skirt, short and full, a round hat with a rim wide enough for shade, a pair of strong gloves with gauntlets, and shoes of sensible thickness, with broad soles and low heels. When I go botanizing, I wear trail runners, which, if you think about it, are shoes of sensible thickness with broad soles and low heels. I wear old race t-shirts and athletic clothing made from technical fabric. I wear baseball caps instead of a, a round hat. And my gloves have magical touchscreen pads on the fingertips, because instead of collecting plant specimens in a tin box, I snap photographs and record data on my smartphone. But as much as the attire has changed, botanizing, getting outside and studying plants, is almost timeless. In the same magazine piece, Annie writes, it will take patience, 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 but nothing more. There is no magic about it, only attention and perseverance. This motto carried me through my PhD. <laughs> I, met early, I met Annie early in graduate school when I was working in Acadia National Park in Maine, where I studied the ecological effects of climate change on plant communities. Studying climate change in New England is tough. Our plant communities have been subjected to a great deal of change. European settlement, agricultural abandonment, waves of development, plain vanilla year-to-year -year variation. We've been burning fossil fuels for a long time, coinciding with all of these other processes, and scientists have only recently started to look for the ecological effects of climate change. So while we know a lot about our current plant communities, the after or during pictures of our planetary makeover, we need more before pictures. Henry David Thoreau is a powerful before picture. His journals contain records of the dates of flowering and leaf out in Concord, Massachusetts. The timing of flowering and leaf out, ecologists call this phenology, is tied to spring temperatures. Most plants bloom earlier in warm years and later in cool years. And these small phenological events can ripple out across an ecosystem. If flowering occurs before pollinators are flying, or if an early leafing invasive species shades out the later leaves of a native plant. There are consequences for reproduction, competition, and food webs. These long-term data sets of leaf out and flowering phenology, like Thoreau's journals, can tell us how plants respond to changes in climate. Thoreau's not unusual for noticing seasonal changes or recording phenology in his journal, but he has influential name recognition. My PhD advisor always refers to the town as Thoreau's conquered, and he loves to use the Thoreau connection to start conversations. With Thoreau, you can talk about climate change without polar bears or icebergs. His data is simple and local and recognizable. Thoreau, it turns out, knew my 19th century girlfriend. They were both residents of Thoreau's Concord in the 1840s and 1850s. Thoreau was, or Annie was born while Thoreau was a Harvard student, and as a kid, she used to follow him through the fields and woods of Concord on botanizing trips. A century and a half later, I would find myself following my advisor, who was following Thoreau's notes, through the fields and woods of Concord once again. When I started graduate school, I set out to find the Thoreau of the North. I expected that the archives at Acadia National Park on Mount Desert Island would be full of journals as detailed and meticulous as Thoreau's. And in Acadia, I could ignore some of the development pressures that plague studies in Thoreau's Concord, because Acadia has been a national park since 1916. In the decades before 1916, Mount Desert Island supported farming, fishing, granite quarries, sawmills. Two groups of people summered on the island, the wealthy East Coast elites in their lavish hotels and cottages, 
and the Wabanaki, who had lived on the main coast for thousands of years and now set up summer encampments in the villages. Annie was one of the summer cottage people. She was a school teacher in Andover, Massachusetts, and in the 1880s, she and her husband built a house on the island. Mount Desert Island is a little over 100 square miles of granite ridges, glacially carved ponds and wetlands, rolling hills, and rocky intertidal zones. It's less than 1% of the land of the state of Maine, but it contains over half of the natural plant communities on the state. In 1894, it supported 680 plant species, including 106 that are locally extinct today. We know this because a group of college boys who bonded over their shared interests in natural history and documenting themselves left behind a gold mine of historical records. These college boys called themselves the Champlain Society. <laughs> the society formed in 1880 in a Harvard dorm room with the intent of spending the summer exploring the natural history of Mount Desert Island. They kept daily logbooks full of entries like the Champlain Society flag design, their field excursions, epic poems describing their exploits, photographs of their campsite, and progress towards their goals in the departments of botany, ornithology, geology. In the winter, they convened dinner parties, complete with letterpress printed menus, at which the departments presented annual reports and made plans for the next summer. Membership lasted long after Harvard graduation. The last Champlain Society logbook is from the summer of 1888, and many of the boys grew up to own houses on the island as adults. Their writing is credited with spurring some of the first conversations around conservation and a national park on Mount Desert Island. But from my perspective, their most incredible contribution is creating a botanist out of a pre-law student and getting him to publish The Flora of Mount Desert Island, Maine in 1894. Edward Lothrop Rand, the chair of the botanical department, was the lawyer botanist. He led the department's efforts to compile a complete list of every plant species on the island. In the Champlain Society logbooks, he appears as an earnest and studious kid, while the other Champlain boys row boats across Somme Sound to meet the young ladies at the fashionable hotels. Rand stays behind to work on his botanizing mission. Rand graduated from Harvard College and then Harvard Law School. The society disbanded, and yet he continued to come back summer after summer to botanize on Mount Desert Island and work on his book. The Champlain Society logbooks and the botanical department reports are littered with the names of other scientists and hobbyists who studied the, the island's plants and ferns and mosses and orchids. Rand worked with all of them. I copied down those names and searched the archives, hoping that one of these collaborators would be record, or had recorded the dates of flowering or leaf out on Mount Desert Island in the 19th century. I expected to find my dissertation, my Thoreau. Instead, I found Annie. Annie is cited over 25 times in Rand's flora. She is the source for a fern, a moss, four orchids, a crowberry, a plantain, a catnip, a skullcap, a mint, a bellflower. Still today, there are pressed plants at Harvard that she collected with Edward Rand. I love thinking about this. Annie was in her 40s, botanizing around this island with a 20-something Harvard boy. <laughs> Annie discovered Rhododendron rhodora forma albiflora, a white rhodora. Typically, Rhodora has deep purple petals with indigo freckles. It's in the same family as blueberries and huckleberries, and it blooms before it leaves out, creating the illusion of a plant engulfed in violet. I had never heard of a white Rhodora before, and so when I read about Annie's, I hunted down her herbarium specimen at Harvard's Gray Herbarium. In tight, neat script, she describes this flower, pure white, was collected on the island in 1888. In 2013, I stumbled across a plant with bright white petals in the middle of a patch of standard issue purple rhodora. The white rhodora sat in the saddle between Cedar Swamp Mountain and Sargent Mountain in Acadia National Park. It was my favorite spot that spring. Capturing photographs of the white rhodora made me feel a kinship with Annie. 
At the time, I was struggling to track down her field books or records. She wrote so meticulously about botany in her magazine pieces that I was sure she must have kept logbooks full of detailed notes, maybe even dates of flowering. But my searches came up empty. Finding the white Rhodora was like finding a piece of Annie alive on the island. I haven't seen it since. The white Rhodora is apparently an ephemeral phenomenon. I'm telling the story of Annie Sawyer Downs because her field books, if they existed, didn't make it to posterity. There are no epic poems or hand-drawn flags for her. Her contributions are recorded in the scraps of other stories. She's a citation, a specimen label, a note next to the description of her summer cottage, still standing in Southwest Harbor. I love Annie perhaps because she is half shadow, and it's easy for me to project this relationship between us. I botanize where she botanized, so we must be soulmates. Annie is who I would have been if I had been born in the 1830s instead of the 1980s. The end of the 19th century was an interesting time in botany, especially in Maine. Maine was still a bit of a frontier. There were new species to discover, but also railroads and steamships to carry your specimens home to Harvard and civilization. The Champlain Society represents an age of amateur enthusiasm for natural history. The Society members all pursued careers outside of science, while unironically pledging their loyalty and their field summers to the Society's scientific goals. In the years after the Society disbanded, efforts to professionalize the natural sciences made this mix of non-science students on natural history excursions increasingly rare. And since it was the 19th century, professionalization meant flipping the narrative to emphasize the masculinity of botany. Flowers had an effeminate reputation. In Maine, there's good reason for this. Among the most prolific and most badass of 19th century botanists is Kate Furbish, who explored the Allagash River in remote Aroostook County while producing beautiful and detailed watercolors of the plants of Maine. Edward Rand was remembered by his colleagues as a capital tramper, but Furbish's fieldwork makes Rand's time on Mount Desert Island look like a trip to the spa. <laughs> In 1881, Furbish published a record of her time botanizing in Aroostook County. Six years later, Science published a short piece with the rhetorical title, Is Botany a Suitable Study for Young Men? Their answer was, of course, yes. It builds mental discipline and promotes physical activity, with the subtext that it was not suitable for young women. The New England Botanical Club assumed this perspective when it formed in 1895, and women were excluded from membership into the 1960s. But in the last years of the 19th century, Annie continued to write and botanize. In 1892, she publishes How I Botanize. In 1894, she was cited in the book, The Orchids of New England. In 1895, she headlined a meeting of the Appalachian Mountain Club. I love Annie because she got just enough of herself into the history books, right as science and the New England Botanical Club were erecting their No Girls Allowed signs. I love how she writes about botany and how the stories of her that survive paint the portrait of a capable and practical botanist. And I really love knowing that in the summers when the Champlain Society was setting off fireworks at their campsite and hosting canoe races amongst themselves, Annie was on the island too, the steady presence of a middle-aged woman who wore shoes of a sensible thickness and packed a pocket knife. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question. Yeah. So did Annie make it into your dissertation? Unfortunately, she didn't. I never found any records that she had kept. So while I used all of Edward Rand's um, The Floor of Mount Desert Island to look at how plant communities had changed over time, so I could say these things became more abundant, these things disappeared, I couldn't really look at how changes in flowering time had happened on the island. But recording phenology is back in fashion. And so everyone can get 
the National Phonology Network's app on their phone and make their own records, just like Thoreau, and like Annie probably did, <laughs> um, and help ecologists like me to track changes in timings of flowering and leaf out.